hey, let's talk about Dark Table Stack. Um, I've talked about the stack before in a couple of ways, um, but what I'm going to talk now about is stack manipulation and some of these stack features, both here and inside an image. Um, just to demystify it a little bit. And this all came about because somebody posted on Darktable Unofficial on Facebook, hey, what's your wish list? And I posted back a couple of wish lists about stack and turned out turns out a couple of them are already supported. So I learned something. So that made me dig into the stack a little bit more and actually read the manual. And I thought I'd share what I, what I found. Um, so here are what, 22 images? 22 images that are all very similar. Um, let's go into one. Let's make it easy. Make sure it's clear that's the, the edit one. Let's go into this one and you will see that by default there is always a stack. Um, these four are always added by um, Darktable. There's nothing you can do about it. These two I have added myself. And I went into that, I'll show you which video I talked about that. The reason I did is usually when you start highlights, um, when you switch on shadow and highlights by default, the setting is something like this, which is not what I want. I don't want that, I, I don't want that jarringness. Um, yeah, that's the default. What I like to, how I like to use shadows and highlights is I like to start at a zeroed and then decide subtly, do I want to go up or down with these? So in this video, this video I went into how to redefine, like kind of a workaround to make that happen. And the workaround is basically you set up a zeroed level and you always make it switch on. So I do that for shadow and highlights and local contrast because I want them both to be unjarring and I because I come in here and I decide do I want to go up a little bit, do I want to go down a little bit. So first thing about the history stack is notice that we now have two entries for local contrast. Um, one, one purpose and use of this stack over here is if you've done something, you can go back to the previous setting and then move forward. Or you can go way back and see how something was. And then now actually, if I'm here and I go to a module and I do something else, it wipes out newer stuff in the stack. So it's kind of, it's kind of an undo to the point that you click. Um, so let's do something, let's do another local contrast change. Pass this. If we go to local contrast, change something. Now look, um, we have two local contrasts here, and that's what this compressed stack is for. This is super useful. If you've done a million edits, and this stack is say, say 80, 50, 80 things high. I've had that experience where then I've, I've created a really huge stack to get an image to where I want it. And then I'm copying the settings from that one image and pasting them to all other images. And everything just slows down because what it appears is that the dark nail thumbnailer is sequentially going through that stack to create the thumbnails. So if your thumbnails have a huge, if your, if your images have a huge stack, then the thumbnailer is working really hard. So what I would now do is I compress that stack down so that I'm just copying the current state of every single module and cloning that across. When I talk about cloning across, I've done a couple of videos. This one um, on kind of bulk editing and something a while back. I don't remember where it is. It was, I think it was basketball or something. I don't see it. Workflow in Darktable, select and bulk processing. So I, what I did in that is, and I'll do it again right now. Let's take an image, I'm gonna discard that stack. Let's 
just a super fast edit on this image. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do kind of my normal stuff, which is I'm going to, for portrait, I'm going to drop that down to about 85. I'm going to raise this because it does kind of a dodge and burn thing. I'm going to add some contrast. No, just for fun, I'm going to desaturate this. How does that look? Kind of like that. I'm going to raise exposure until I'm just getting some red. I've already got some of those. I probably should have done that first. I'm not going to mess with white balance this time around for this demo. Okay. And then I'm going to do something so that it's easy to differentiate which of these photos are edited and which aren't. So let's just go with that. So clearly, this is edited. These are not edited. These are completely virgin. So now, if I was doing proofs or something, I'd do a copy all of that. And I'd paste all. And then I have a bunch of images that are exactly the same state. So that's a really good thing to do if you're, if you have a bunch of images that are very similar and you want to do a quick pass on them all, just work on one and then copy the whole stack across another. Um, I am going to discard that again and show you when you might use copy all paste all and when you might use copy paste. Let's say in this image, I've done a crop. And say this whole set is very similar lighting, but different, um, different framing. Then instead of, I can either do copy or copy all, but say I did copy I'll copy everything except that crop, then I can paste everything to everything else, and it's pasting everything except the crop, which is more useful to me if I'm creating proofs or something. So, let's talk about this, which I hadn't realized existed. Um, let's say I've had second thoughts about this image. I don't like the white balance. I'm going to warm it up using white balance, which makes no sense here because the reason it's cold is color correction, but never mind. Let's just do that. I'm going to fix that and I say, oh yeah, that's exactly what I want. So now, if I copy, select none, and just copy those two things that I changed, and paste it to this. If a pen is on, let's do it very visually. Paste, and again, I could have done this the other way around. I could have copied all and then just pasted the exposure and white balance. Um, if I paste to that, I'm just pasting those changes. If, on the other hand, I do overwrite, which is a little bit dangerous, and I paste just those two. I've effectively completely wiped out the previous history stack and just added the white balance and exposure. So obviously that is not what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do, if I'm, if I'm using overwrite, it would be more of a copy all paste and overwrite everything except that crop again. I'm kind of back to where I was with that. So <clears throat> overwrite is if you're if you have images where you've done some playing around and you are want to just wipe out that playing around, then it's better to use overwrite and paste everything because if you use append, let's copy all here. Let's take the last one and use a pen and paste everything except the crop. Okay. And paste everything except the crop. 
and paste everything except the crop. We go in here and we have a huge history stack, um, which we can of course compress, but um, it's good to have at the back of your mind what is actually going on here. But it's, but it's dangerous because if you've forgotten that that is an overwrite and you've a bunch of, you've done a bunch of editing and a bunch of images, I mean, imagine, imagine you're working on a whole set and all you want to do is a tiny white balance set for the whole thing. If you do this, you're wiping out your entire stack for all of your images and that would be really painful. Um, in terms of stack, when you're actually in an image, make note of these. You can create a, you can create a style right here from inside an image, and you can apply a style from inside an image. And styles are are just segments of history stack. Um, so yeah, like this, I could create a style. Uh, and that's the same dialogue pretty much as we saw with the copy paste except it doesn't have the select all select none operatives but um, so styles are effectively history stacks a um, couple of interesting things with this um, the right sidecar file is a very odd button a very odd button. I don't even know. Somebody tell me how that can be used. You can set in settings that each individual image doesn't have its own sidecar file. I guess that means there's one sidecar file for every single image. What is a sidecar file? A sidecar file is uh, shoes. So note that for every single image we have a matching .xmp file, that is the sidecar file. And if we look at one of those, four, six, zero, it is an XML file, which is the history of, have we got no, what is going on there? So that's interesting. I was expecting to see the history stack in there. Why is it not? Where is the history stack if it's not in here? Oh, it's because this isn't one of these images which I've worked on. Duh. Um, duh. Let's deal with this one, which is 2173021. That confused the hell out of me. So, in that sidecar file, what we're seeing is the sharpen setting, the base curve setting, the bilateral setting the whatever all these are. So that's our history stack in the sidecar file. So I don't know the situation where you would need to write a sidecar file unless you're using a single sidecar file for any file for, for all images which is one of the settings in which case you could go dink write that sidecar file. Now the load sidecar file seems bizarre because effectively, if you went and if we went and okay, let's dump that and let's load the sidecar file for this one, which is what did I say it was? Two one seven three. So if we load the sidecar file for. One seven three. Then what we have done is exactly the same as start from 
scratch. Copy all. Paste all. So we've done exactly that by loading its sidecar file. So I was thinking, why would you do that? I mean, I guess you could take a bunch of sidecar files and put them somewhere in a folder and load them but then that's just a f that's just the same as having um, styles so I was a bit confused so this is somewhere where I looked at the manual and found out something really interesting let's take that and discard it now let's do the load sidecar file and go into uh, any other folder and look at an exported uh, look at an exported JPEG so here's an exported JPEG from Darktable and if I use that as the source for load sidecar file it has just loaded the history stack no it didn't what's going on there Was there nothing in that? Let's try that again. Let's load a sidecar file from a JPEG that I know actually had something. Uh, vampires. Let's take one of these JPEGs. Check it out. That is the history stack of that image before it was exported as a JPEG. I don't know how it does that. So I guess I guess encapsulated in a JPEG file is the history is the history stack, which blows my mind. So um, that's really interesting. So if you if you lost a bunch of edits but you had but you had a JPEG that you previously exported or if you know you have a JPEG some way that you exported out a JPEG and you want to do the same kind of thing on another file, you can load the sidecar file from the JPEG. That blew my mind. I did not know that. So if there's any other crazy unknowns that anybody that anybody knows about the stack stuff, let me know. Like I like are sidecar files compatible across different applications? I think there is I think there are some I think there are some compatibilities there between different applications. Um, there you go. I found that super interesting. What else is there to say? Not a whole lot. Um, that is my little delve into history stack. Um, and yeah, for sure, I would love to be able to click compress stack over here. That would be really nice. Um, I think we've dealt with everything to do with the history stack. Yeah, that's it. Have a nice day. Oh, unlike and subscribe, please.